Good evening. My name is Terry Emond, and I am the Program Director and COO at the Lupus Foundation of America Georgia Chapter. Thank you all for joining this call tonight. I am pleased tonight to introduce Dr. Sam Lim. Dr. Lim is a professor of medicine in the Division of Rheumatology at Emory University School of Medicine, professor of epidemiology at the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University, and chief of rheumatology for Grady Health Systems. At this time, I would like to turn the call over to Dr. Sam Lim and thank him for being on this call with us. Thank you everybody for joining. What I hope to do is more to strike some dialogue when we have a session towards the end. And really what's gonna be clear out of all of this is that we have a lot more to go, a lot more to do. We need to shape together as a community where we're going with uh, lupus research, especially as it relates to how it impacts men. We are concerned about this and we want to help equip you all, those who live with lupus as men, those who care for men with living with lupus um, in your journey. How to do that, uh, you know, I need to hear from you as well. So what I'll do is actually, I was given a, a bunch of questions beforehand and I'm just going to go through them in a way um, that I think makes some sense. They, they cover various topics, but hopefully there'll be stuff in there that speak to you. Uh, it'll be incomplete, like I said, because with a very limited amount of time that we have. Um, but again, this is just a start. And what I'm really hoping is that from this comes a, a dialogue that through the Brotherhood of the Wolf that you'll find out later, uh, through the ongoing support of the Lupus Foundation, we'll continue to, to meet and help shape the research, help shape the support. And so that over time, we have more and more of the answers. We may not have it all, uh, but we'll be in a better shape in the future than where we are today, each and every time that we meet. So we hope to do that together. Okay. Um, I. I was tempted to really start, like I said, going into kind of a, a lecture standpoint, but I'm really going to avoid that. And, and I've just kind of pasted some questions and, and added a few slides, but not much more. And it'll be more of a off the top of the head discussion from my standpoint. So one, one of the questions that's come out is, are there any studies on the level of hormones, especially male and female hormones and their relationship to lupus? And if so, what can we learn from those studies? Yes, uh, I mean, if, if, you, if you just look, sit back and, and you see who gets affected with lupus, as we all very know very well here in this group, <clears throat> the, the majority of people with lupus are women and uh, who develop it usually in um, the so-called childbearing years, somewhere between 13 and, and 40 or so. Uh, and what's the major difference between females and males? And, and one of them is going to be uh, the issues of hormones. It, it dictates a lot of the, the biology and, and obviously it's gonna potentially impact the immune system. And that's really a lot of the, re the research has shown that um, female dominant hormones like estrogen have a big role to play in terms of the immune response. Um, it's, it's not easy to go through, but just be, rest assured that there's a lot of data about estrogens doing this and that, all um, changes that implicate that they, they might have a role in the development of lupus. And as I said, when women develop lupus, they tend to do it in their childbearing years. And that's during the time when uh, they have the highest estrogen levels. Um, there, there are also more flares and a lot of people uh, have their disease uncovered, if you will, <clears throat> as women uh, during pregnancy. And that is a really high time of estrogen levels. Um, what's also been learned is that in terms of the immune responses, the X chromosome, as you know, the main thing that determines the biology difference between females and males are these two different chromosomes in your DNA. And you get one set from each parent. And 
if you get an X from one parent and an X chromosome from another parent, you are XX. And so you're biologically a female. And if you get one X and one Y, you're biologically a male. <clears throat> we know that the X chromosome has encoded into it lots of immune genes, uh, genes that regulate different parts of the immune system that are important in lupus. So when you have two X chromosomes, you potentially have a higher chance of turning on some of those immune mediated genes uh, than if you only had one X chromosome. And interestingly, there are certain conditions where people can have an extra X chromosome, <clears throat> XXY. So they, they can look biologically like male, but have an extra X chromosome. And those people can have a statistically increased risk of developing lupus. There are people that have an X and not a Y chromosome, just a single X. Um, and, and those people have a more difficulty getting lupus. So all, all of these things point to the fact that the biology of um, the difference between males and females as it relates to hormones, um, as it relates to genetic factors on the X and Y chromosome, um, seem to be associated with a higher chance of, of lupus. Um, now, what, what's been done with that information? It's, in the early days, there, there are, have been smaller studies. There are drugs that block estrogen that increase uh, male hormones. Um, by the way, uh, you can look at, the, at it in the flip side. And even though I'm talking mostly to, to men with lupus, the fact that 90% of people with lupus are women, perhaps in general, and obviously it doesn't hold for every single person, but in general, maybe male hormones are quote unquote protective. So there've been trials in the past of medications that either block estrogen or increase certain types of um, male dominant hormones. And <clears throat> Um, there are very small papers in, a long time ago in uh, testing these types of drugs in humans. But the thing with all of these factors is that it's, it's never just one thing. You can't say lupus is caused by X or even X and Y, um, uh, whether you talk about chromosomes or different factors. Uh, lupus is a complex immune disease, not just clinically, but in terms of how it develops. There are multiple factors that in each person is different. So we have a gentleman from Costa Rica who's got extremely different genetics and environment and exposures than perhaps someone else on this uh, webinar, an African-American male who's grown up in the South East uh, US entire, his entire life. And yet the road that they both took to come to lupus are gonna be very different. And for someone with a, a certain genes, it may take it, that person a lot easier to get to lupus based on hormones. Whereas another person with another set of genes that are not high risk for lupus, it, it may take a lot more in terms of hormonal factors and a lot of other things to then cross the line and, and have their body exhibit symptoms. But going back to this question, um, you know, when you just simply block estrogen, increase male hormones, it causes a bunch of other unintended consequences in the human being. And it's just not a, uh, a good approach, a therapy approach that you can, you can make. Um, they've been able to do that in mice and there is a mouse model of lupus. And again, mice are not humans, but the advantage of having an animal model that has a lot of similarities to human lupus is that you can do stuff to, to mice that you can't do to humans. And you know, they've manipulated hormone levels and genes and things like that in, in mice to try to see its effect. And all of that points to the importance of hormones, but on a practical level, that's not gonna be um, a a good or simple approach in terms of therapy for, for human beings. So do men 
living with lupus stay on top of their appointments, treatment plans, and medicines that lead to better management of their lupus? This is a question that I should have actually put towards the end because I'm, I'm wanting to hear this from you all. And I'm gonna circle back to some other questions, but you know, let's just kind of put this off to the side for a second because I'm not here to tell you how, uh, um, you know, what happens when this happens, uh, when, when you don't stay on top of your appointments and treatment plans, you know what happens and you need to be able to ex express that information to us, the, the medical providers and the researchers so that we can help equip you and be part of your team to be, uh, to, to better uh, stay on top of the appointments, the treatment plans and the medicines. So, um, just hold that off to the side for a second and we'll, we'll circle back to that. But, but I do think um, that men in general have obviously different social circumstances and behavioral tendencies from women. I mean, there are many differences between men and women. There are a lot of similarities, but there are some general differences and could those general differences play a role in behavior and other factors and results that, that lead to different outcomes in, in lupus? I mean, undoubtedly, um, exactly what it is about men in general or the majority of men that lead to certain outcomes, we, we, we don't have good scientific information along those lines, but I'm sure you have a lot of suspicions. And so that's the kind of feedback that I'm really craving to help us uh, figure out some of these answers better. Uh, June is Men's Health Month. What message do you have to men about health disparities and better taking care of themselves? And, you know, a lot of what these um, designations are, like Lupus Awareness Month, Men's Health Month, and you have, you know, days for this and months for that, you know, those are things that uh, it, it's a good reason for people to become more aware and to generally raise awareness so that we can either make light of certain issues and problems that will improve the, the public health. But in terms of a man living with lupus and being aware that this is Men's Health Month, it, it, it really is to make you all and others that live with lupus as men aware that there is a lot that you have in your control in terms of improving your health. We may not know all the answers about what to do, um, but there is so much that we do know. And it, it, unless you have a good team, and I'm not just talking about doctors, and of course the medical team is extremely important, but unless you have good emotional support um, informational support, um, instrumental support means, you know, uh, things like helping get medications or taking someone to the doctor. I mean, all of these things are within people's powers to at least to try to help improve and that will help improve your, your health in general. So in, in terms of men's health month, I think this is a, a good time to, to really think about housekeeping issues. What, am I doing, what am I not doing, uh, and that I need that will help equip me to be better moving forward for the rest of the year. Do I have a good healthcare team in place? And I know sometimes that's challenging, especially in, in this country where, where healthcare is not necessarily a right, but have I maximized the opportunities on that end? Uh, am I taking my medications and if I'm not taking my medications, is it because of cost or is it because I'm scared to? And if I'm scared to, why? Why am I? Am I getting the answers to understand? Do I have the communication? And that, that's all, all that's not easy as an individual, just on the healthcare side. And so unless you have the support of other people who understand what you're going through to be able to bounce these things off of and, and to be accountable to, you need somebody to look back at you as we all do 
when we go through something tough that's long and enduring, um, someone who can empathize, but at the same time give you tough love and, and say that, you know, you, we've been mentioning this for a while, but you need to do that. I mean, we all need that. So this is a time to really kind of re retool, if you will, for the coming year. And so that next June, uh, we can we can say that we've improved a lot in terms of factors that will improve our health. <clears throat> How can an increase in the number of men participating in clinical trials help the lupus community? Um, by clinical trials, I, I think of uh, drug studies. There are a lot of you know, research is the overall umbrella. There's a lot of different types of research. And we, we need to do a lot of different types of research when it comes to lupus in general, but also men with lupus. But when you talk about developing safer and more effective treatments in terms of medications for lupus, uh, this is the term that we, I often hear from the medical side, clinical trials. So when you think about it in that regards, why do we need men uh, in those clinical trials? And the one example that I came up with real quickly is, and, and this is representative of almost every study that I can think of, and I can almost guarantee it, in lupus. This is the pivotal study that helped get belimumab or Benlista approved uh, in the United States for lupus, the first drug with a specific indication by the Food and Drug Administration for lupus in over 50 years. So it was a big deal and it was published in 2011. But you know, I wanted to point out a, a table in the study where it talks about who was involved in that trial. And here you have basically, well, there's three groups in the study. There are those that did not receive the drug called the placebo arm. And then there's two other groups that received different doses of the bilimumab. And each group had nearly 300 people. So it's 900 people overall, but overall you can see that there were basically about 92, 93% female. And, and you can argue that that is generally what you would see in in, um, in the public, about 90% female to male. And, uh, but what I would point out also is that there was a big to do, some of you may know, about the underrepresentation of African Americans in the, the Limimab studies. And you can see here that African Americans or, or those who self identify as Blacks were about 14 to 15% of the entire study. And that uh, legitimately got some people up in arms and it concerned the FDA enough that it gave an approval for belimumab to enter the US market as an approved drug for lupus, but it had to list in the package insert that legal document that's with all your prescriptions in black type that uh, it, we're not sure if we had enough African Americans in the study to to know whether it was effective for that group. And the reason the African Americans um, were picked out, especially because in the U.S., that's uh, one of the largest minority groups and ones that have obviously a, a greater burden of, of lupus. But if you take that some same sort of rationale and What's been thrown around by smaller studies, and, it, it, and I think most people claim to be generally true, is that men tend to have uh, more severe lupus. Um, and even though it's a, a quote unquote minority group within lupus of only about 10%, it's, it's a very special group, and, and you all are, and it's a very understudied group. But yet everybody keeps pointing to how in general, there tends to be more severe disease, more severe kidney involvement. So we need to be really sure that these drugs are safe and effective for, for men as a special group within lupus. Um, but yet for African-American subgroup, they, the FDA pointed that out and made the company do a separate study just for African-Americans or blacks with lupus called Embrace. Uh, and, and that's, that's the degree to which they took it seriously, but yet they did not blink a, a, an eye for a second as to 
only having seven or eight percent representation of men. So there's no way that this study can know for sure whether bilimumab is um, less effective, as effective, or more effective uh, in them compared to women. So I, I, I'm not trying to make it uncomfortable for anybody um, who has been on bilimumab as a male. There's no reason to think of that um, that men respond differently. And it's been out in the market long enough where we would be picking up on some strong signals after it, it, it's been um, used a lot in general clinical care. But this is kind of the mindset of the, of the scientific community is that it, it's a female disease and you all know this more than anyone else. Um, and that you know, race, racial and ethnic issues are important uh, and yet everybody jumps to that, but doesn't think about the differences potentially between men and women, when the biology between men and women are, the differences are much stronger than the bio biologic differences between different uh, racial and ethnic groups. So all this to say is that, you know, how can we know about the impact in, of uh, drug treatments and other studies for that matter in men with lupus if we don't have more men with lupus in the clinical trials and and how do we to do that and i think having a community like you all are developing as one way to disseminate information and that's part of what i hope will be developed over the the coming time is that you you and I'd be happy to facilitate this, that you stay in touch with the ongoing research community, um, understand what trials are going on, how to get that information. And if it's right for you, I'm not saying that everybody should go into clinical trials, but whenever possible, men should consider it. Now, do men experience lupus differently than females from a physical, mental, or psychological aspect? And it's a really interesting question uh, this is a link that Chris, you gave me a while back. It's uh, one of these news outlets that picked up on a uh, study that was presented at the American College of Rheumatology meeting that happened to be in Atlanta this past November. And you can see the headline, male patients with lupus often have more severe disease, receive little support. Um, they claim it's a national survey of, of male patients with lupus. It's run out of the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City. And they found that 58% of men reported feeling depressed for several days or more than half the days in the previous two weeks. And more than half received no support. Um, and so that, that's not good when you're living with a chronic disease. It's an 85 question survey that they disseminated nationally um, to males with lupus over the age of 18. It was advertised via online forums and at major hospitals throughout New York. And there were uh, surveys that looked at, survey questions that looked at different components in people's lives. And they, um, people got on it through a link now, if you look at the details, there were 112 participants. 61% um, identified themselves as white. And yeah, this is one of kind of the frustrating things for me, uh, you know, time and time and time again, whether it be clinical trials or drug studies, or and also these kind of quote unquote nationwide online studies, there seems to be um, more of a rep representation from um, or less, let's, let's look at it this way. There seems to be relatively um, a minority representation from the minority groups that actually form the majority of the cases. So uh, African Americans and Hispanics and Asians are, are known to have a much higher rate of lupus relative to Caucasians, but yet their voice in terms of the results of these types of studies are relatively less because they continue to be a much smaller group. And um, here I'll point out that 94% reported having health insurance. And I can tell you that 94% of the group that we follow here in Georgia do not have um, 
health insurance that the majority don't. Uh, so I just wanted to quickly run through, and I, and I know I'm getting close to the end of my time, but I don't want to get lost in the details. For those of you who don't know, the CDC funded a, a registry where we identified, uh, um, we tried to identify as many people with lupus as we could in a certain part of the city of Atlanta, and it was utilizing some public health powers through the CDC and the state health department. And then we were allowed to contact people to recruit them into an ongoing um, research group that we call GOAL, where they agreed to follow um, us at least with annual surveys. And we asked them questions that we can get a sense of how lupus is af affecting their lives. And I didn't have time to make this look better, but I just want to give you some spreadsheet level data from goal and many of you are in goal and some of you are but um, this is from a couple of years ago but it, re it still represents what's going on now from over 775 participants which for a lupus study is huge um, up here you'll see a male column and a female column 721 females 53 males uh, and you can see, um, and then the numbers here, you'll see a lot of different numbers, but I would focus on, if you want to look at differences between males and females, look at the, uh, what's in the parentheses between the two, and that's percentages. So since there's sm uh, less males than females, the absolute numbers that you'll see really aren't going to make sense, but the percentages will. It's comparing apples and apples. So you see here that Disease duration, the average of number of years that people had lupus when they completed the survey. So it was an average of 13.4 um, years in men and men, 15.7 years in female, females. And the p-value is a statistical way of saying whether there might be um, a real difference between the two. If the p-value is less than 0.05, that's one general way of saying that it there may be something there. So on this slide here, there are no p-values less than 0.05. Um, and you'll see kind of a lot of numbers. Uh, I'll point out down here, those who live in poverty, we're talking a third, over a third, in both male and female groups live in poverty, which should not happen, in, especially in this country. Um, this is just talking about cardiovascular risk. Uh, and you, I just look at the p-values here really quickly. There's nothing less than 0.05. Um, you do see that almost 30% in men are on cholesterol medications. Uh, only 2% have uh, are on diabetes medicines. A lot, I mean, we're in the South, and so there's a lot of high blood pressure here too. So we're talking nearly 60% in both groups on blood pressure medications. This is family history of heart disease. So about 8% in men, 12% in women. Uh, and then I'm just for the sake of time, I'm gonna move on here. This is, I just, I'm just doing this very quickly to give you a sense of what's going on in Georgia. And, and this is a Georgia specific webinar. So forgive me for, for those of you who are not from Georgia, but it may be interesting to you anyway. Um, in terms of alcohol use, uh, this is less than 0.05, and you can see that the percentages in terms of more alcohol drinks per week are higher in men compared to women, and I guess that kind of makes sense, and generally speaking. Uh, those who have ever smoked more than 100 cigarettes, we're talking 46% in men versus 25 in women. Currently smoking, 9% uh, in men, 6.3% in women. So when we talk about discrimination, there is one instrument called the Everyday Discrimination Instrument. It, it's various questions along, and this isn't all of them, but they, they talk about questions regarding courtesy or have, being afforded less courtesy, less respect, poor service because of who you are. Um, by the way, these scores are, are kind of high in general compared to the general population. So lupus patients in general experience more discrimination, but the differences between male and female is not there statistically, at least at this level. There's an interesting instrument called the superwoman schema. I know this is a male group, 
And it really came out of a lot of social science literature about um, how there are a lot of single uh, mothers in the black community, and that's why they call it superwoman, and sort of this need to present themselves as being a superwoman, being strong, less not vulnerable to things because they need to be there for their children and their other families. And this is not an instrument that is limited to just women, uh, but we've been using that and it would be an interesting way to explore whether having these types of psychological features, does that improve or make, make it harder to get care that you need for, for lupus? And we just don't know yet. And, and we, 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 we haven't really dug into this information much, uh, but, but you can see that there are some differences between men and women, as you may imagine. So along the lines of characteristics and behaviors, there are certainly things that, that we should explore further. Um, and what do we do with this information? I mean, that can, that can help tailor education and events like this if we had a better idea of what type of personalities or behavior patterns are there. It, it, it will also help make things more culturally appropriate too. So in terms of general stress, there's no statistical difference, but it is pretty high. Uh, we, and, and these are just a small sample actually of what we get in goal, but um, negative life events regarding being assaulted, being sued, uh, undergoing divorce, um, you know, there, there are some differences, more men have experienced a serious injury or witnessed it. Um, down here, more women have experienced their partner having an affair uh, or, and ending uh, a long and important friendship. And those are things that definitely have a biologic impact. It can affect your behaviors, which can affect your health seeking care and and um, your biology and what happens with your lupus, but it, it also can definitely impact your immune system. Um, different ways of coping we ask about, and again, for the sake of time, I'm just gonna fly through these. We Mental health, physical health. By the way, be, there was no major difference between coping except in terms of women go to church more, more seek more religion, I guess, as, as a way of coping compared to men. Um, mental and physical, global health, there is no statistical difference between men and women, uh, no major difference between men and women in terms of the level of, and, and quality of the anxiety. Um, as, and fatigue, there was more fatigue statistically in females compared to males. It doesn't mean that you men are not battling fatigue. I don't want you to get that message. Fatigue across the board, male or female and lupus, along with these other factors that I'm mentioning, are very real and very significant. That's the message that we're going, getting across to the rest of the community. But in terms of differences between men and women that we may learn and have an insight of what is different and, and, could, and should be tailored for men, right now there, there isn't um, too, too much. And part of this, by the way, is it could be a statistical issue when you have a smaller group of, of men compared to women, uh, it's hard to, find a statistical difference. So the more men we have in this type of study, not unlike the clinical trial example that I just gave you, if there is a difference between a men and women, having more men in there will allow the statistics to bear that out better. So just sitting back and hoping that these studies will show some of the important issues that you're dealing with and expecting others to do that especially in men, it's, it's going to be an, being an issue. We need every single one of you. Um, would it benefit the lupus community overall if, if specific studies were geared towards men with lupus? You know, I think we need the scientific data in order to, um, to under, understand the differences uh, and what special or what sim or what similar issues there are between men and women. So you know, absolutely, we need um, men-specific research efforts so that we could tailor some of the approach for you all 
Um, and I know that all of you are thinking of ways that you feel the general lupus healthcare community, um, as well as the community at large has not met your needs. And, and you wonder why, and maybe some of you don't wonder why, and it's because it just seems to be more geared towards a female perspective. We, we need to understand that better. Um, and part of that way is through, through research. So, and the rest of the questions that I'm not gonna address directly is because of the fact that I can't answer these questions. These are questions that I need you all to show me what the answers are, right? I mean, I am uh, a male, but I don't have lupus. I'm, I'm, I, I don't live in your communities. Um, I'm, for most of you, I am not the same race or ethnicity. I've, I've treated probably more people with lupus in the state, but I could do 10 times more than that. And I will never fully understand what it's like to be in your shoes. So I've learned a long time ago to be humble and to learn from my patients. And this is a situation where um, I need your input more than anyone else. So I'm sorry to go long and I'll end here and and slides. Dr. Lim, thank you so much for your presentation tonight. It was um, it was great. Gave a lot of information. Pointed out a lot of the differences between men and women living with lupus. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Just want to, just want to make sure. Just want to make sure. So at this point, I want to introduce a couple of men living with lupus in Georgia, um, and I know that they rely heavily on on the kind of things that Dr. Lim says and the information that he brings to us all the time through his um, his weekly town halls, through the information that he does, through sharing at men's support group meetings. We really appreciate um, your input and your knowledge and your compassion and your humility, Dr. Lim. So thank you. Um, I'd like At this time, I'd like to introduce Chris Reed. So Chris Reed is the head of our uh, Brotherhood of the Wolf men's support group. And he is... Um, he is also the head of our advocacy committee in the Georgia chapter, and he is the co-chair of the Georgia Council on Lupus Education and Awareness. And Chris is, um, has been living with lupus, and I'm gonna let him tell you his story and let, let you hear about Chris and Chris's words. So Chris, um, without further ado, you can take the floor. Thank you, Terry, and uh, thank you, Dr. Lim, for that, that amazing presentation. Uh, thank you all. To all of you men and women who are on the, the call this evening. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly humbled to be on a call with Dr. Lim. I, I, I look up to him uh, tremendously. Um, so I was diagnosed with lupus at the age of 16, 30 years ago. So that was 1990. Um, my lupus, I lived with lupus probably numerous years prior. My parents did everything they could to, to try and figure out why I was having various medical conditions, particularly chronic um, migraine and, and uh, cluster headaches. Uh, but uh, over time, I began to develop um, other conditions that, that all of you probably are familiar with related to lupus. Um, by the time I was 16, I was in ICU. Um, and by then, my immune system had detected my heart, lungs, um, GI tract, uh, blood system through anemia, uh, as well as my central nervous system. Um, I was given specific tests um, because the doctors did not know what I had at all. Did, uh, I was in the hospital for, for several weeks, and it wasn't until very, the last, uh, probably the last week that the doctors figured out I had lupus. So prior to that, they tested me for, for many, many different conditions. I went through very embarrassing and traumatic um, test at times um, because, you know, I as a 16 year old um, was having various conditions that, that doctors did not uh, really understand. I certainly believe that the fact that I was a male certainly impeded the ability of, of me to be diagnosed initially with, with lupus. And I think, um, I think about it and my mom's on the, on the 
the line as well. I'm, she can remember it. I'm, I can remember going to doctors even after I got the diagnosis of lupus and doctors um, running the test anyway, or at least running the blood tests that are related to lupus uh, out of curiosity as to whether or not I, I actually had lupus. And then they get the blood work and they're like, oh yeah, you're definitely, your numbers are off the charts. And so certainly as a, as a man back in the 90s when um, the prevalence of lupus in men was not necessarily as documented. Um, even I'd, I'd heard um, doctors, uh, researchers who indicated they didn't believe that men had lupus uh, at the time. It would certainly understand uh, how gender can certainly impact uh, one's diagnosis. So since I've lived with lupus for 30 years, uh, certainly I've had my flares and my remissions. Um, you know, I've continued to have some pleurisy and pericarditis throughout time. Um, I currently live with uh, neuropathy, neuropathy, some vascular issues, and in 2004, I was diagnosed with lupus nephritis. Um, despite all of that, um, I was able to graduate from college, uh, graduate from law school, uh, working at, here in Atlanta. Um, in 2018, I, I almost died of a blood infection. Uh, so certainly that was um, a traumatic experience for me. And even since then, it's been harder and harder for me to recover from that that experience. And I've been in a flare since since uh, early 2018. Um, but really, the Lupus Foundation of America has been my been my saving grace. Um, you know, I joined the chapter at the age of 16. Uh, my mom is a social worker and she said, we're going to the foundation and we're gonna figure out what this thing is and we're gonna fight it. She knew how um, traumatic and um, cumbersome that, that lupus can be because she works in, worked in hospitals. So she understood lupus a little more than I did. But, um, you know, as, as a male with lupus and as a very young person with lupus, I was often um, the youngest person in the room and, and even to this day, sometimes the only male in a room um, at any event related to lupus. Uh, one of the most, um, I guess, eye-opening experiences that I, that I certainly had as a, as a young person was, was my first bone density scan was done in a mammogram center. So here I am in a room with all women going to get a bone density scan, but here's the word mammogram sitting right in front of me. Um, and certainly that, that made me think, wow, this is what it is to live with what's a disease that's considered to be one of, of, of women. And, um, but, you know, that certainly hasn't stopped me. Uh, I have the honor of working with Dr. Lim uh, on the Georgia Council on Lupus Education and Awareness. Uh, and I have the great honor of, of being um, co-facilitator of the Brotherhood of the Wolf. Uh, which has been around for um, approximately, I believe it's nine years. Uh, my colleague, my friend, my brother, Thomas Walters, who started the group, is unable to participate due, due to a lupus flare right now. Um, but I hope he's listening on the line right now because uh, certainly I couldn't have done, we couldn't have done the work we're doing with the Brotherhood of the Wolf had it not been um, for him. Uh, Thomas started the group as a way to provide men with an outlet, um, you know, he felt like I feel that, that we are often excluded uh, from, from the conversation. And so he said, we need to do something certainly about, about that. Um, and so we now feel as a group that we belong much more to, to the work that the Lupus Foundation does belong more to the work that other organizations do with related to loop, lupus. The Brotherhood of the Wolf encourages education and it encourages support um, and it encourages men to participate in, in events like, like, like this one. Um, I've had the opportunity myself to connect males to programs um, across the country that are gender-based studies on, on public health, soci sociological issues, one of which is the one that Dr. Lim mentioned at Hospital for Special Surgery. Um, one of the most important things that, that we do as a Brotherhood of the Wolf is we encourage men to get the help that they need, to get the medical attention they need. You know, it's Men's Health Month right now. And, and I think back to 
my family trying to figure out where this lupus came from. Why, why do I have lupus? Is it genetic? And, and the thing that I always go back to is that my, di my grandfather passed away from pericarditis, a condition that I have over and over and over again in the last 30 years. But he was the type of man that did not go to the doctor and he thought that the hospitals were only for people who were going to die. And so, you know, I, I encourage you and I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged to see this many men on the, on the line, but I'm also know that, you know, there's an estimated 150,000 men in the country are living with, with lupus. Um, so, you know, I'd like to know where are they and I'd love for them to, to take the opportunity to encourage themselves and empower themselves to participate in programs um, like a support group, like the Brotherhood of the Wolf, or find their own group in their own country, in their own state or in their own country. So certainly I want to thank you guys for being on the line. Um, you can find out more information about the Brotherhood of the Wolf by going to uh, lupus.org forward slash Georgia and forward slash Brotherhood of the Wolf um, hyphen of, it's Brotherhood of the Brotherhood hyphen of the Wolf. And we'll put a link in the chat to that. So thank you, Terry, and thank you, Dr. Lim. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for, am I muted? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you, Chris. Thank you for your um, telling us about your journey. And it's so important for men to share what they go through because it is unique and it's different and not enough men share it. And for the efforts that you've put together over since 2007 with Thomas to really, to really, really um, be persistent with this men's support group because it wasn't always easy. You guys got together and there weren't a lot of people involved and you guys have just really stuck with it and grown this group and you've done a tremendous job. And uh, I want to mention that GSK is going to be, do is going to be debuting a, um, a video about the Brotherhood of the Loop, a Brotherhood of the Wolf, the work that they do. And it's really going to be fantastic. So Chris, thank you again for your presentation. So you're, for your, for speaking. I, now would like to introduce somebody who he refers to himself as an old dude with lupus. That's when I asked him last night how to introduce himself. He said, I'm an old dude, dude with lupus. Richard Croker has um, shared some of his journey with me last night. And I think that it's going to be um, interesting for him to share it with you and to talk about what he's been through. And Richard, it is an honor to introduce you and we'd love to hear your story. Okay, thank you, Terry. Um, and thank you, Dr. Lim and Chris also thank you for um, pulling me in with Brotherhoods of the Wolves. I was diagnosed with lupus um, back in 2013 at the age of 59. So that's one reason why I say I'm an old dude with lupus. And um, at, at, at that point in time, I, I didn't know what was going on with my body. My body was just going through some changes, I was getting exhausted and it was just, it w wasn't a normal type of exhaustion. And I also had this, in my body being inflamed and, and in so much pain and didn't, again, didn't know exactly what was going on. I used to be extremely athletic, um, walk four or five miles a day. I played a lot of basketball, did a little boxing and, and so forth. And, and I've done that for a very long time, played in league ball until I was 50 years old. So um, not knowing what was going on with my body, we went to go for a walk one day, couldn't get, couldn't get past my neighbor's house. And that was just um, a, a few yards away. And so I came back in the house and I told my wife, I said, I need to go to the doctor. And when I went to the doctor, my primary doctor, she gave me the um, a -N -N -A, -N a test for lupus and told me that I had a touch of lupus, but she wants me to see a rheumatologist. So when I went to the rheumatologist um, and I gave him the report from my doctor, he says, well, I'll give you the test and come back in three months and we'll evaluate it. He called me the very next day and told me I had full blown lupus and my kidneys were in danger of failing and that I need to start my medication right away. So at, at that point in time, it was like, okay, um, what, what do I do? Because, you know, with lupus, all you guys know is you can hardly get out of bed. 
um, there's, there's things that you used to doing that you can't do anymore. And so I, I myself had to um, develop a way and, and say to myself, okay, what are you going to do now? You're going to lay here or die or, or you're going to help yourself. So basically what I did, I said, I'm going to help myself. So again, like I told you, I was a pretty active guy. I used to do 500 push-ups a day. Could not do one push-up. And every day I would try to do a push-up and I would try to do a push-up and try to do a push-up. Finally, I got one push-up in. And at that point in time, I was involved with the um, support group and they were all females and I was the only male in there. And at deal, dealing with the group of females, and you know, it felt kind of funny, but I had asked one of the young ladies there, is there a male group? And they gave me Chris's number. And I got to call Chris and Chris and I stayed on the phone for about an hour. And he gave me a lot of information and a lot of support. And, and, and introduced me to Tom and got me involved with the Brotherhood of the Wolves. And at, at that point in time, um, you, you know that you need the support. And, and a lot of times you're afraid to ask for support, but you need to have somebody that understands the stuff that you're going through because you start explaining these things to people, to your family members, and, and you tell them what you're going through and they don't quite understand it because they don't see anything physically wrong with you. In my case, it was a little different because I had lost an extreme amount of weight. So um, getting get involved with um, the, the right doctors, to make sure that you have a team of doctors. And I think that's the most important thing is having a team of doctors, your nephrologist, your rheumatologist, um, the ophthalmologist, and th those are basically very important aspects of having lupus and dealing with lupus. So um, my, my advice to you guys is just to make sure that, that you work with your team of doctors. And the other big thing that really helped me out was getting on the exercise program. And at that point in time, like I told you, I couldn't do one push-up. I couldn't, I couldn't even lift a plate up. I had to get my wife to open the jar for me. And it's kind of embarrassing, but oh, dude, did he hung out, got stronger. I'm doing about two, 300 push ups now. So, you know, I just want you guys just to make sure you stay with, stay with your program, stay positive, um, be smart about your approach to lupus. And in, in other words, make sure you take care of yourselves. Um, make sure that you have the right support group. Um, another support I got was from an insurance co company and there was a, um, a psychologist who I used to talk to once a month and um, she was a, a great support. So that's another thing. If you can get somebody to support you and, and talk through your issues and that someone that allow you to talk, that that'd be a great help. So right now, I think I'm handling my lupus really well, even though I go through other issues. Um, I mentioned the ophthalmologist. Well, um, having lupus, I, I developed a cataracts. And when they told me I had cataracts, they said, well, again, it was like, um, it, it's slow developing and, you know, we'll deal with it next year. Well, a month later, I was back in there and I had to have cataract surgery. And so I had to deal with that. I just got over knee surgery again because, again, I'm hard-headed. You know, I'm, I'm doing things that sometimes maybe I, I push myself a little bit and I tore a, a tendon in my knee. And prior to that, I had to go through surgery in 2016 of a knee replacement. <laughs> so, you know... And, and through all of that, I stay positive. You know, um, my lupus is it, it's in control. Um, so I, I stay strong and I, and I hope that you guys will stay strong as well. So that, that's my story. And the old dude with lupus is gonna be around here for a long time. So, 
That's Richard, it. Richard, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and Chris and Richard, we've got a few more minutes here. So I just have a couple couple of questions I thought maybe you could answer. Mm -hmm. um, so R Richard, based on your experience, what advice would you give to a new, to a male newly diagnosed with lupus related to staying connected with other people? With, with, a, with a lupus network, what advice would you give to them? How important is that? It's extremely important. Again, like I said, I mentioned before, when you go to a support group, you have people that's dealing with the same issues that you have. So they're able to understand it and, and give you some advice on how they've gone through it. Um, we've all gone through pretty much the same thing. Um, it, it may be a little different in one area, but the approach is the same. So I advise you to stay stay in contact with your own lupus support group and, and get in contact with one if you don't have one. There's one in your city, I'm pretty sure. And and that's the advice that I give you and have the support at home and encourage your people at home to um, also support you. Thank you. That's a great answer. That's a great answer. Chris, if you were to... Um talk to people how do you talk to the people that are closest to you about going through a flare or what you're going through about your fatigue just about what's going on to you day going on with you and i'm not talking about talking to your support group I'm talking to people around you the people that you care about how do you talk to them about your lupus so you know my much of my condition is is internal i do not have um rashes um never had rashes on my on my skin uh, so it sometimes it can be difficult in this case because the individuals cannot see it but what i do and and you know i think my my family my partner have, have always kind of under, understood over time what i'm going through because i've lived with it for so long but i always have to communicate and um uh, it's it's i have a very open um level of communication with my entire um care system or support system uh, certainly that I have one of the things that I do tell them particularly in in my household is is <laughs> they know the spoon theory very well if, if you if uh, many of you have probably heard of it you know I let them know that look I even have a t-shirt that says spoon theory but you know if an individual has 12 spoons waking up and they are a healthy person you know they can get throughout the day get through a day with with those 12 spoons would basically represents a level of, of energy um, or a level of your ability to, to fu function for the day. But someone with lupus may lose all of their spoons by the time they get to noon by taking their medicine, taking a shower, taking shaving, and, and so forth. So I've, I've explained that to anyone that's in my life, that there are days when I cannot uh, get out of bed or there are days when um, getting out of bed is, is difficult and and therefore I must um, ask for help. And so um, individuals in my, in my life have, have learned to kind of ask or, and read. But I guess the best advice um, that I really give is, is be as open as possible and explain the disease. Take, take individuals to a lupus meeting or give them a pamphlet, let them watch a video. Um, I do the same with my job. Um, I've always been open with every employer that I've ever had since diagnosis, since my diagnosis. I've always been very, very open. Um, not that I am, am telling every individual to be open with their employer because those things vary, but certainly I always have been open because there are those instances in which, you know, an employer may say, oh, I need you to do this or that. And it may be something that you may not be capable of doing at that time. And so it's important to be as open as possible with those around you and those who are around every day. Um, you know, I, uh, two years ago, I wrote basically a letter uh, um, to my, my employer explaining my, my condition in detail and explaining, look, you know, these are things you want me to do, but I'm not capable of, of necessarily doing them and functioning one of those was driving to work 45 minutes to two hours um some days in in atlanta traffic and and finally now uh you know i'm able to work from home and so those are the things that i that um 
that I have done. I think it's important to just be out, be open, communicate with individuals around you about your condition. Otherwise, they're just not going to learn. So awareness is important. That's fantastic. And I like that you talked about not only sharing with the people around you, but with the people that you work with as well, so they can understand what you're going through. Well, we're a little bit over time right now, so I think we're going to bring this to a close. If you guys have additional questions, please send them to either your individual chapter or you can send the questions to me and we can see if we can get answers. Uh, we would certainly like to do this more often and let other men be highlighted and let them speak and tell their stories so that we can get to know you all and, and share. Um, how do you feel about that, Chris? That's great. Um, please go to the, the Georgia chapter's website and look up the Brotherhood of the Wolf. Uh, I did put the link in the website. Um, in addition to that, I think national as well as the Georgia chapter um, has available to you a contact link. So if you want to find out more information about the Georgia chapter, excuse me, the Georgia chapters group or the Brotherhood of the Wolf, um, please um, submit a request for information form uh, or enter your contact information so we can be in touch with you. We love talking to other guys around the country. Um, we, we certainly would like to provide whatever assistance we can to, to men around the country. I talk to men across the country, so it's, it's, it is, uh, it is uh, an honor to, to do what I can to help my fellow brothers. So I want to thank Dr. Lim for his wonderful presentation and Chris and Richard for sharing. Um, I think we can do this more often. I think that this would be, this would be a great idea. But I want to tell you, we are really touched tonight and I've gotten a text from a couple of the leaders from other chapters. It's really touching seeing all of your faces tonight and putting faces to these men living with lupus. You know, we, we, you often hear, you see lupus so oftentimes represented through the face of women. So it's great to see all of your faces. Thank you for stepping up, for joining, and I hope you'll come back and join more of these seminars. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening. All right, thank you, Terry, for hosting. Well, thank you, definitely. And thank you guys for being on the call. Yeah, thank all you guys. Appreciate thank it. Thank you guys. Hang in there, brothers. All right. All right. Let's make sure we all exercise. Exercise, exercise, exercise. Without a doubt. <laughs> thank you guys.